Now let's talk about body details and build of the camera. Size and weight vary from camera to camera. Usually professional full-frame cameras are bigger and heavier than entry-level DSLRs. Some cameras also may or may not be weather sealed. Weather sealing blocks out the elements harmful to the electronics in your camera. For example, dust, water, snow or humidity. How well and how much weather sealing is in your camera varies between manufacturers and also from model to model. Usually more expensive cameras are better weather sealed and more durable. But keep in mind, weather sealing is not exactly the same as water resistant. And it's most certainly not the same as waterproof. I would not take a chance to put my camera on purpose under pouring water or swim with it in a pool. Though, it will give you peace of mind when you are on the beach, for example, and you have a chance to get some water drops or some sand on your camera. But it is not true for all the cameras. There is one, and it is Pentax K30, which is supposed to be completely waterproof. I didn't test it myself, but I saw a test done on it, and it seems to really work. I really hope there will be more cameras like this in the future. You might also want to check out controls and buttons on the camera. They usually vary from model to model as well as from brand to brand. We are not going to go through all of them, but I just want to point out the main differences you might encounter. Let's look at the difference between Nikon D5300, which is an entry-level DSLR, and more advanced Nikon D610. The main difference to me is that entry DSLRs usually have only one command dial, and more advanced cameras have two command dials. Entry-level cameras also do not have control panel data LCD display on top. Also, in entry-level DSLRs, mode dial is usually on the right, and in more advanced cameras it is on the left, which I think is not a big deal. Advanced cameras also have some additional buttons on the left from the screen. I think all of this makes more advanced cameras faster and easier to operate, especially when you're using manual mode and need better accessibility to all your settings. You will also find some differences between cameras of different brand. Like for example, position of command dial in Nikon and Canon. For example, I as a Nikon user find position of command dials in Canon totally inconvenient. Probably the Canon users can say the same about Nikon. So you have to go and try controls for yourself. Though I'm sure you get used to it as well. Another factor to consider is whether camera has a built-in pop-up flash or it doesn't. Actually, most entry-level or some semi-pro cameras would have a pop-up flash, but a lot of pro cameras do not have one, simply because it is expected that professional photographers will use an external flash instead, which performs much better than pop-up flash. I tend to rarely use it myself, since I prefer to use high ISOs or external attachable speed light, simply because I don't like the look of straight on pop-up flash, or sometimes it's not even powerful enough for what I am doing. Though there are some modifiers you can use to get better results with pop-up flash. There is also a case when pop-up flash can come handy and it is as a trigger for off-camera flashes to make them fire at the same time without having to buy separate flash triggers. Another feature which varies from camera to camera is how many storage slots for memory cards camera has and what kind of memory cards you are able to use with your camera. There are cameras who have just one storage slot and there are some which have two, and even some of them can use two different types of 
memory cards like SD cards and CF cards, which are bigger. I think there is a great advantage to be able to use two memory cards at the same time because you can set your camera to record your images on two cards simultaneously and in case one of the cards get corrupted your images will be saved on the second card. High resolution screens will let you to see more details in the image and also you will be able to tell better if your image is sharp. Screen resolution is measured in dots. But you don't really have to worry about this nowadays because most newest DSLRs have good enough screen even on the lower end. Not too long ago, camera manufacturers started to introduce touch screen to their DSLRs. Not all of them have it yet, but I think it might be becoming a norm soon as it is on the phones. I think the main benefit of touch screen might be the ability to tap on the subject on the screen for focus and exposure. And I think it's even more useful for video rather than photo. Those are DSLR cameras which have touch screen at the moment. Some cameras also have flipped out screen. This screen can be very helpful if you are trying to take picture of yourself or filming yourself or also when you would like to take a photo of very low or very high angle where you will not be able to look directly in the viewfinder and you can look on the screen. In this case it can be very helpful. Also keep in mind that there is a difference between flip screen and tilt screen. Of course flip screen is better because it's more flexible, you have more options with it. Also different cameras might have different viewfinder sizes. Viewfinder size describes how big the scene will look in the viewfinder relatively to what the naked eye sees. In general, larger value is better. If the value is smaller than 1, it means that the scene will look a little bit smaller through the viewfinder. Different cameras can have different viewfinder coverage. Some of them 100% and some of them can be only 95%. With 100% of coverage, you will be able to see the scene as it is. But with 95%, you might not be able to see what is on the edges. Though it is nice to have 100% viewfinder, it would not be a deal breaker for me if it wouldn't. Since the area which is not covered is usually very small, and if you really manage to get something in the picture you don't want because of it, you can always crop it off in post-production. There are actually two types of viewfinders. Some of them are pentaprism viewfinders and some of them are pentamero viewfinders. High-end cameras usually include a pentaprism to transmit the images from the lens to the viewfinder. Lower-end cameras, on the other hand, use Pentamiro. A Pentamiro is cheaper and lighter than Pentaprism, which makes the camera would use them more affordable and lighter as well. I wouldn't be getting into technical side of it, but in general with Pentamiro the image you see in the viewfinder will be a little darker and this can make manual focusing a bit harder in the low light. Now let's talk about focusing system. Some cameras might or might not have autofocus motor built into them. This can be important when you, for example, want to use some old lens without autofocus motor built into the lens with a newer body. Though the modern lenses, most of the modern lenses have autofocus built into the lens and usually lens autofocus motor is faster and quieter than the motor which is built in into the camera. For example, Canon users don't even have to worry about it at all, since none of their DSLR bodies have focus motor, but all of their modern lenses do. When it comes to Nikon, most of their high-end bodies do have built-in focus motor, but some of their entry-level bodies do not. 
Nikon's IFS lenses all include focus motor, but IF lenses do not. The only time you will have to be concerned is when you want to use entry-level camera without focus motor with IF lens. The main disadvantage of using body and lens with no built-in autofocus is the fact that you will have to focus manually. Also, sometimes lenses with built-in motor can be larger and more expensive than equivalent lenses without motor. The battery life of the camera also varies, and it's usually measured in the amount of images you're able to take with one charge of the battery. Though this number is only approximate, because battery life will also depend on other factors, for example, using your LCD screen while taking the pictures, capturing videos, maybe using a pop-up flash, so this all can drain the battery as well. Here is a comparison between entry-level and pro DSLR. So the question is, does battery life really matter? Well, it's always nice to have longer battery life, but it wouldn't be a huge concern for me because I would always buy extra batteries. Though the battery life can be very important, for example, for event photographers, because missing that first kiss during the wedding because you run out of battery can really get you in trouble. That is why a lot of event photographers using so-called battery grip. It holds several batteries and it will extend the battery life of the camera when you attach it to it. Please click to watch part 3 about image quality and don't forget to subscribe, follow and check out my website easy-exposure.com